Welcome to viewers around the world. We're here today, thanks to International Crisis Group, with an excellent lineup of experts to discuss Myanmar's 2020 elections taking place on November the 8th, aptly titled Path to Stability or Flashpoint for Conflict. Uh, I'm Gwen Robinson, uh, it's editor at large of Nikkei Asian Review, and I'd, uh, I'll introduce uh, our speakers in a minute just to fill you in or update you and remind you, uh, we're talking about the circumstances surrounding this very controversial election coming up in Myanmar, where the de facto leader Aung San Suu Kyi and her National League for Democracy seem set to win a second five-year term. A crucial democratic test will be whether the poll can convince the country's minorities they're getting fair representation or see more internal conflict at the same time, as we've all read in horror, um, Myanmar is battling a, a very um, a very vicious second wave of uh, COVID-19. There are many issues there, which we'll turn to very shortly. But first, to introduce our speakers, we have Richard Horsey, Crisis Group's Myanmar Senior Advisor and former Myanmar representative of the International Labour Organization. E.E. E. Tolwin, Chief Election Correspondent at Frontier Myanmar, an online and weekly journal, and formerly a journalist with the Myanmar Times, whose reporting on Myanmar political affairs has been widely followed for the past decade. And uh, last but not least, we have Jonas Garstor, uh, leader of the main opposition Labour Party in Norway, former foreign minister of Norway and a crisis group. <laughs> Um, to briefly explain the format today. We'll hear from our speakers, uh, then have a short discussion before opening for a Q&A session in about half an hour. Everyone is welcome to ask, ask questions, um, but if you'd like to ask a question, please just type in the Q&A box on Zoom, stating your name and affiliation. We'll try to get to all questions, uh, but apologies in advance if we run out of time. Um, and to remind you, this session will be recorded and it's live streamed on Facebook. So before we begin the uh, discussion, I'd just like to um, turn over to Richard Horsey, who's just authored an excellent report for Crisis Group on the election and is now sitting in the middle of Yangon, I presume still under lockdown, Richard, um, with That's a right. few thoughts on the situation. Thanks very much, uh, Gwen, and hello, everyone. Um, you know, the first thing I'd like to say uh, about uh, these elections in Myanmar on the 10th of November is that these are only uh, the second democratic elections in Myanmar since 1960. So these are a really big deal. Um, and it's important to remember that these are very significant, particularly in a part of the world where not to name any names, but electoral democracy is not exactly going from strength uh, to strength. Now, it's become very clear over the last five years in Myanmar that elections won't solve some of the country's most difficult challenges. The Rohingya crisis, the civil conflict, which has been raging for decades, uh, the illicit economy. But I don't think anyone feels that those huge challenges would be better served or better resolved by a country with less democracy uh, and without elections. So these, uh, these elections are, are very significant. There's not much suspense in these elections. The outcome is not very much in doubt. It seems very likely uh, that there will be another five-year term for Do Aung San Suu Kyi and uh, her NLD, uh, and that there will be um, people who are unhappy with that outcome, but that outcome will not be challenged uh, outside of the uh, framework of the law. So uh, that is quite significant also. Um, and it comes, this, uh, this uh, predictability in a sense, comes despite some very unpredictable uh, dynamics in Myanmar at the moment, and particularly the uh, surge uh, over the last six weeks or so uh, in coronavirus cases that Gwen referred to uh, and an economic crisis uh, that has been brought on by the lockdowns uh, and general uh, economic climate as a result of COVID. But just because the outcome uh, is not very much in doubt, just because 
the result will probably look fairly similar to the elections last time in 2015. This doesn't mean uh, that the consequences will uh, be the same, very far from it. 2015 was a moment of unity. It was a moment where the country came together and looked forward uh, to a new future under a democratically elected government. And even those people who weren't strong supporters of the NLD, uh, different ethnic minority communities, uh, some in opposition, nevertheless, most people felt that this was a moment of hope for the country and moving forward. This time, the same results or similar results are going to produce division uh, rather than unity. And I'd like to spend a, a couple of uh, minutes explaining why that is. Myanmar has a British style first past the post uh, electoral system. And I don't want to get into a philosophical discussion uh, about the merits of various electoral systems, but just to say that first past the post is particularly ill suited to the particular conditions uh, of Myanmar, a country that has a huge diversity of communities, large number of minorities, um, and where the state building uh, process is incomplete. That is that many of those minorities do not yet feel that they have uh, been accorded uh, a proper place in the, in the union of Myanmar uh, and that the initial challenges at the moment of independence uh, seven decades ago have not uh, yet been resolved. Um, and one of the things that we know about elections is uh, that they create winners and losers. And this particular electoral system will amplify uh, majority victory, NLD victory, uh, at the expense uh, of others, uh, particularly uh, minority communities uh, who will feel that this uh, electoral system marginalizes them in parliamentary and political terms. And of course, the Rohingya have been disenfranchised uh, already before 2015 and will not be part uh, really of this election uh, at all. So, the 2015 election went ahead with the same, uh, you know, same electoral system. So why so much difference in the approach of, of minority communities? Well, in 2015, it wasn't that minority communities thought that they could do well in purely terms of seats. It wasn't that they thought that they could win the election or carve out significant leverage. It was that they felt that they had an, uh, an ally in the NLD, that by working together with the NLD, either in some form of coalition or by pushing in the same direction and working together on solving the country's problems, uh, that they would have uh, genuine input uh, into uh, their political futures. So in 2015, part of this moment of hope was that minority communities saw the NLD as a likely uh, ally. Fast forward to 2020, and most ethnic minority communities, their leaders, their political representatives see the NLD as an adversary, not as an ally. Um, and this was uh, underlined uh, last week when the election commission uh, announced cancellations in elections in different parts of the country, either because some areas were under the control of opposition armed groups, the electoral authorities couldn't get there to, 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 to um, compile voter lists, or uh, because of conflict, which meant holding elections would be uh, um, uh, unsafe. Those were the criteria used uh, by the election commission to determine cancellations. But unfortunately, this process is very untransparent. There was no detailed rationale given for the decisions. Uh, and many ethnic communities were surprised, even shocked by the extent of cancellations in places that they claim uh, were safe and stable and where elections could have been held. And they saw many of the cancellation decisions as deliberate gerrymandering by the government to improve the chances uh, of the NLD in those areas. Whether that is true or not, it is the strongly held perception. And what is also pretty clear is that the election commission is not a truly independent body. And so that puts it in a difficult position for the election commission to try to claim uh, uh, that it did make these decisions on, on purely fair and objective grounds. Uh, and that was made even more difficult by some of the areas where the election commission did not go ahead 
in a number of NLD strongholds in conflict affected areas, sometimes the most conflict affected areas in the country, elections are so far going ahead. And that's reinforced this feeling that this was about gerrymandering, not about safety. Um, the other aspect of these elections uh, uh, that skews the results is the constitution itself, which mandates 25% of the seats in all national and regional parliamentary bodies uh, are held by serving military officers appointed by the commander in chief. And since the military is a Burman uh, majoritarian dominated institution, uh, that also skews things uh, away from minority representation. So it's very clear uh, what is uh, uh, needed in the eyes of those who are losers in this electoral system. They want to see constitutional reform and they want to see electoral system reform. Unfortunately, neither of those is likely. The Myanmar military uh, has a veto on constitutional reform that it, is, that it has deployed even recently. So constitutional change appears out of reach for the near future. The NLD, on the other hand, is not interested in electoral system reform. And why would it be? It's served extremely well by the current first past the post system. So uh, either way, both of those reforms uh, are likely to be blocked. Now, what this means is that if minority communities start to see that the path of electoral democracy is not one that will allow them uh, you know, to, to achieve their aspirations uh, and, and objectives, uh, they are likely to revert to uh, different means. And if the political door, the electoral door is closing, another door is always open in Myanmar, and that is the door of insurrection and direct action. So I do think we have to be very worried uh, that these elections could sow greater division, create more losers or perceived losers, uh, and carry a significant risk of uh, amplifying, exacerbating our armed conflict in Myanmar uh, in the months uh, and years ahead. So what can be done about this? If the constitution can't be changed and if electoral system reform is out of reach, there is nevertheless something very important that the NLD uh, can do that is not prohibited by the constitution. And that would be to treat uh, ethnic communities, ethnic political parties as partners uh, in a nation building and uh, peaceful future rather than as electoral adversaries. That has not been the case up till now, but it would be uh, a move that would have enormous significance that could change the political dynamics in the country and it's a move that is within the gift uh, of the NLD. Uh, thanks very much. Well, Richard, that uh, on that happy note, uh, um, you've uh, I think you've effectively answered about half my questions, but uh, there is plenty more to address. So I'd like to turn to EE e. and Jonas, um, maybe uh, to kick off with a, a general question, which uh, also you might have some thoughts on this too, Richard. Um, but let's just say, I think the, the top line issue is really about credibility of this poll, no matter what all these things you say on the negative and, and positive sides about any election might be better than none to, to pursue this um, sort of somewhat skewed democratic uh, path of a democratic system. Um, but given the suspensions uh, in various constituencies of voting around the country, and the reservations expressed by international and domestic experts, including the UN's own you know, special envoy on Myanmar, um, to what extent can this election be credible at all? Um, perhaps, E, you could uh, um, address that uh, first. Uh, yes, I can, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Green. Um, yes. Um, cancellation of election in some area across the country became the biggest issue in Myanmar because uh, the decision could uh, disenfranchise uh, 1.5 million of uh, 38 million eligible voters in Myanmar. And then more than uh, 1. 1. 1.2 million people in conflict area Rakhine State lost to exercise um, their right to vote. Um, because of the decision, uh, through criticism by the political party and because UEC failed to consult uh, with the political parties in making the decision and there was 
no uh, specific explanation with the announcement. And then, so political party uh, said, because uh, they checked uh, that 2015, 2015 um, general election reset, uh, those area won by the ethnic party, not NND. Uh, that's why they said, so the UEC, the union election body intentionally uh, decided not to hold a lesson in those area. And but UEC said, um, so they made the decision based on the uh, recommendation of the uh, military. But so we, UEC did not um, uh, explain, uh, did not explain much about the situation. But so we got some more information at the press conference, uh, which um, called um, October 24, the, mini the military press conference. Uh, they said like, uh, yes, so those of the cancellation area based on the uh, recommendation of the military, but um, so the, chance, the, Pala, the constituency Palawa in Chen State, so they recommended not to hold a lesson in those area. But so this uh, constituency, um, Palawa, not included in the cancellation list of the UEC. But military um, agreed to provide security if UEC want to hold election in those area. And another reason is ethnic body said some area are possible to hold election because though there is no serious fighting is happening there. Um, but um, as my experience, um, it's obvious to say, uh, that area to be safe, even there is no fighting there. <coughs> According to the um, military explanation, um, the constituency in Mangan, um, Township in Shen State, so this area under the control of the um, Shen Ethnic M Group, RCSS, um, control area. And so during the election campaign period, um, officer from Ethnic M Group, they asked uh, head of the local villagers not to allow any election campaign in the village and Nanshan, candidate of Nanshan ethnic party, they not allowed to get into the village for their campaign and a man uh, was shot by the, uh, by the army um, also in September. Because of this condition, the um, military um, suggested not to hold election in this area. I think that kind of but, but AA, maybe 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 you could address that step back a little bit with all of these things and and yes. tell us whether you think this is actually harming the basic credibility of the elections in the eyes of not just in ethnic areas but also in Bama dominated areas. Um, do you yes. think overall this is hurting the image of the elections and people's faith in it? I read that many people won't vote this time. What's yeah. your impression? Yeah. So yeah, um, this is uh, one of the issue and cancel cancellation of election in ethnic area. That is one of the issue. Uh, the political party criticized the commission management of the election. Um, the commission drew criticism over flaw voter list, the lack of transparent uh, dialogue between political party, civil society, and media, and also removing some important right uh, to be observed by the election observ observation group and censorship of political party speech in free airtime slot on state media. And also, uh, uh, other political party they face some kind of restriction and they cannot do campaign freely uh, because of the um, COVID-19 restriction. So that right. they can. So do you get the yeah. impression that um, voters are not going to turn out in the numbers no. they did last time? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, <coughs> because of, uh, due to that circumstance, so uh, most of the people are saying that the election um, could not be free and fair. And right. for me, like, it is hard to say how the election will be. Uh, free for all and how the public will be safe um, from the threat of COVID-19. There are so many things happening in Myanmar. Yeah. Right, so let's uh, let's return to some of those issues you raised. I am interested in the voter turnout uh, question because it was huge last time. And as Richard said, it was a great moment of unity and hope. 
But this time, I don't think people, not only if you've got elections that aren't very credible in people's eyes already, but they have to brave COVID-19 in order to go and cast their vote. It might, yeah. uh, it might really deter people. But let's turn to Jonas. Um, uh, you know, as we've heard, concerns are very widespread in the international community as well about the conduct and credibility of these elections. But it's also extremely clear, I think, that there's a, still a very strong desire in Western capitals, at least, to support Myanmar's fledgling democracy and for want of, you know, alternatives to continue the kind of aid and uh, assistance uh, that uh, the NLD-led government has had from, particularly from Europe and America and uh, other, uh, other major countries. What's the perspective from the international viewpoint, particularly from Europe, um, you know, given all that? And also given, I think, particularly in Europe, the um, attention paid to the case at the International Court of Justice on against uh, on uh, Myanmar's um, uh, alleged genocide of uh, Rohingya uh, is uh, also reverberating quite strongly. Um, sorry, that's a bit of a messy question. Well, thank you, Wen, uh, and thank you for this excellent um, debate and for the introduction on the paper that Richard wrote. And of course, it's with some humiliation and, and, and um, uh, admiration that I, I listen to A.A. Tolwin, who sits on the inside experiencing that very close on. But I would like to, you know, um, as you say, and you asked one, me the question, to, to lift the perspective seen from, from geographically far away and go 10 years back in time. Uh, uh, when I was foreign minister from 2005 till 2012, uh, uh, I mean, we, we went through a complete change in how we approached Burma, Myanmar. Norway, actually, after the cyclone in 2008, decided to engage quite actively through the humanitarian track to get in touch with authorities on the, uh, uh, on the side in, in Myanmar to, to get dialogue tracks started up. So we did that in 2008, 9, and 10 uh, with great obstacles and great opposition because there was a strong mobilization also in my country for the human rights situation and against the, uh, the, the authoritarian rule of the military in Myanmar. And then came the changes. And I, I was, uh, as the first foreign minister, going into Myanmar in January 2012 with the, uh, with, with the hope that we were now seeing in Asia, in this region, perhaps a real transformation, uh, which, which came, remember this was uh, after the Arab Spring, uh, this was in a moment where democracy was gaining ground. And then we've been through uh, the years since 2015, when elections came about. And I think that the, the, the broad picture still is that Myanmar has taken huge steps away from what really was the uh, the, 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 the picture from, from the 60s until democratic reform came about. And if you look at the region as a whole and the neighborhood, still it is a story which has, I think, the expectation that we are still within the, what shall I say, the realm of, of, of hoping what democracy can deliver. Yes, there are hurdles. Yes, there is this extraordinary human rights situation with the Rohingyas which I think should concern also governments from Europe a lot more than it does at the moment. Uh, but, but I still think that these elections will be seen and interpreted as being still with, its, uh, with, with their um, uh, shortcomings, democratic elections. And first mm -hmm. by the post, well, I mean, it is a system that is used by uh, the oldest democracies on the globe, it is not a very effective, not representative system when you have great diversity, but in Europe you will have a history that 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 in a way um, sums up that if you if you have too proportional system you lose control, and we've seen that also uh, in, in back back in the history. So, in, in my view, I I would address it the following way. These elections will take place. They will give the result that I think Richard describes quite, uh, 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 quite clearly. And the question is then, what can then facilitate constitutional reform in the years to come? What can be done from the outside to support uh, um, 
control, put pressure on 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 uh, uh, on government and and the, the ruling party in Myanmar to go in 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 that direction. And without reform and with uh, deteriorating human rights situation and violations, what should be the international community's response? I think there is a great reluctance to go back to where we were before 2010, 11, 12, you know, starting a new debate about sanctions. And, and, and what I, th I think uh, the West, if we can use that expression, should think very thoroughly through um, uh, the dilemmas facing us if we now embark on a, uh, on a policy of isolation, of, of, of pressure, of cutting ties uh, in a situation where we can still influence and, 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 and be part of uh, uh, something which can, can uh, uh, Im improve the internal situation. I think uh, the uh, dilemmas linked to the isolation in uh, leading up to uh, 2010, 10, 11, 12 uh, still are there. Uh, and, uh, uh, and that is why, um, uh, yeah, but the international yeah. community is, is, um, is a diverse uh, actor here, let me put it that way, you know, from China in the region, the neighbors of Myanmar. Uh, and on to 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 Europe, uh, where there is not a single voice uh, speaking out. So these elections will be taken as elections, as I see it. And the big question is, how do we stay engaged, uh, uh, influence, and 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 forward these uh, positions uh, uh, with the uh, the ruling parties of of Myanmar after the elections? Well, yes, indeed. I mean, that might be. You've just asked your own question. I mean, I I, I wonder if you've got an answer to that. Well, I, 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 I still believe that the policy of engagement is the right one, because right. there are so, so many important uh, uh, Myanmar, we should not forget, is still, you know, in its very early phase of walking down the, the, the lane of democracy. All democracies take shape from their own, from on their own history. This uh, first party through the post, it has a British legacy. Uh, then it is a country of extreme diversity, more diverse than any European country. And let me just put it this way, I think the, the value of what the crisis group is doing here and what is Richard is communicating is that it is bringing some sober evaluation to how to read Myanmar to the West, which has been too much in a way shaped by images. I mean, I come from a country that awarded where the Nobel Committee awarded the Peace Prize uh, to Aung San Suu Kyi. And, and now people are really, you know, asking uh, what kind of research was behind that decision given what has happened since 2015. So, you know, it is a very complex country to, un to understand, which to me brings, uh, you know, the instinct of being um, a bit cautious about drawing uh, intense conclusions and still believing that a policy of engagement, close engagement, both from the economic and political side uh, from the international community is the right way to go. Thank you very much. Um, before we turn to some questions that are very interesting questions coming in from viewers, I'd just like to check, since I think, uh, as mentioned, I think one, one key to the perception of credibility, at least in the eyes of um, the population, and also some to some extent the international community, is the voter turnout. If it's abysmally low, I think that is a further hit to credibility. Richard, what's your uh, take so far on indications of voter turnout amidst this terrible, you know, COVID second wave and uh, all the other disincentives. I don't know what the very latest is also on, on the issue of violence in ethnic areas, but what's your uh, sense of uh, voter turnout? Sure. Um, it's hard to predict. I think it would be uh, difficult to see the same heights, uh, you know, 80% turnout or whatever the precise number was in 2015. I think it'd be hard to imagine uh, better than that. The question is, how much worse will it be? On the one hand, people may be nervous to go out and vote, uh, you know, for an election where the outcome is not that uh, unclear, especially in the center of the country where the NLD is really dominant. Uh, people may feel that their vote doesn't doesn't count that much. You know, we see this in many uh, democratic countries uh, also. Um, against that, um, they still want to show their support for their preferred candidates. There's still a novelty to elections in Myanmar. It's still a sense of we didn't have this for most of all, all of our lives. So let's, you know, recognize this moment. Everyone wants to get a selfie on Instagram 
on Facebook mainly with their finger with the purple ink that, right. at the end of the electoral process. And don't forget, people have been locked down, uh, not quite a full lockdown, but a quite strict lockdown in much of uh, the country, Yangon especially. This is a chance to legally go out of your house, maybe bump into some friends, sh share a bit of gossip. I mean, people may they seize this opportunity to get out of their houses as well. So I don't think we can predict a calamitous uh, drop in, uh, in, in turnout, but I think there are big questions there. Interesting. E.E., what's your, as a reporter on the ground and with a network of reporters there, what's your sense um, of what the turnout is likely to be? I think so, that, sorry. yeah. I'm not quite sure the voter turnout will be low because of the current situation. Uh, many people are campaign. Uh, many people are joining on a bid rally and so a bid gathering election campaign, also in Yangon. And so that I think people the election turnout will not be low, and so people they will yeah they will go out and vote um for the party of their choice. Yeah. Right. Okay, so you think it will be low, possibly? A little bit, not much, yeah. A little bit low, okay. Um, look, uh, there's so many good questions coming in. I'd, li I'd like to turn to those, um, maybe start with one from um, uh, Chansu Baran uh, of the Turkish Embassy in, in Myanmar, who asks um, whether anyone can explain how the number of seats in parliament would be affected by the cancellations, which I think is an excellent question uh, because I'm, I'm still not absolutely clear how many uh, constituencies are actually canceled. What does that mean for the next parliament? Um, Richard, you're an election geek. I'm sure you've studied this. <laughs> So there are, there are 22 constituencies in the national parliament that will see no voting. Those seats will be empty. Uh, so that's, that's a quite out of how many? And that's in the lower house? Uh, yeah. No, that's the, the whole national parliament, the upper house and the lower house, 22 seats. That's quite a small number compared to the total. There are 498 seats in total elected and another 168 military appointees. So we're talking about a 664 seat union parliament uh, with 22 seats cancelled. So it's clearly not going to move the needle significantly, but in almost none of these uh, cancelled seats was the NLD likely to win. So you've removed 22 opponents from the NLD. So it's reduced by about 11 seats, the number of seats the NLD needs to win in order to have an outright majority. That's very interesting. And are any of them in urban areas or are these all rural? Uh, so, so constituencies always contain an urban and a rural component. Um, so yes, these are towns, if it's cancellations, these are, these are towns with rural areas as well. It's a different picture in the subnational state and region parliaments. If you look at somewhere like Rakhine State, most seats have been cancelled. <coughs> the majority is now likely to be an NLD and military uh, block. Uh, and on Rakhine State, the Rakhine people feel that the NLD and the military are a block even if the, the military and the NLD may not see it that way. So big impact at a subnational level, small impact uh, at a national level, very big political impact. Right, and presumably quite a lot of people who are going to be angry about not having a vote. And uh, I presume it's also knocked out all these uh, internally displaced people uh, as well, right? That's added maybe a quarter of a million so there's about 1.6 million voters, uh, 1.5, something like that, uh, as he said earlier, who won't now have a chance to vote. And then, of course, there are many who never made it onto the electoral roll in the first place. Right. The Rohingya, people in Wa area, which uh, the Election Commission can't go, and so on. Right. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, we've got a question from Toshi Kudo, director of GMI from Japan who asks, what are the political goals of ethnic minorities actually in concrete terms of either the parties themselves or the you know, ethnic armed organizations? Um, would uh, either of you like to uh, answer that? I mean, E, do you, have, I presume you've done, well, you, Frontier has done some good reports on uh, ethnic areas. Uh, what is your impression of what the political goals are? of the ethnic minorities? I don't know exactly about their 
those of the Politike Party. But so they, when I interview with them, they went to, uh, they went to, um, in the, in the, so their idea is quite different from 2015 because uh, 2015 election, um, so ethnic nationality, they voted to, uh, they voted uh, for the NND party because so they have high hope, uh, NND will bring um, in, internet peace and also the development of the region. But within five years, uh, they understand that so they should not be relying on other party to do for themselves. That's why they want to they want to do themselves and they want to rely themselves. So that's why in this election they want uh, they um, um, they said they want to vote for the so ethnic party and also uh, ethnic M group. Um, they um, they are pushing ethnic nationality to vote uh, for the ethnic party. So that I think. Um, so they want to they want to rely on themselves uh, to do for the development of the uh, region and for the peace process rather than relying on um, an anybody. Right. And uh, Richard, what's your um, take after your uh, study of some of these uh, key ethnic areas, uh, including the the EAO, the ethnic armed organisations, as well as the parties, in terms of their actual concrete political goals? Yeah, I mean, I fully agree with what he said. Um, I think if we go beyond politics and look at the communities and what they want, they want to be treated as equals in a union, not as second class citizens. That's their over overwhelming desire. Um, and, you know, they are referred to as minorities because they have smaller population, but they don't see themselves as minorities. They're the majority in their areas. They see themselves as, as, as nationals of a, of a different group and a different area which volunteered to join the country at independence, and they've never got the equality that they were promised. So that's what it's all about. Um, you know, they often phrase it in terms of federalism to also touch on another question that's been, uh, that's been asked. They, they frame it in terms of federalism. But federalism is an idea, not a specific proposal for the future. Uh, it's an idea of equality. It's an idea of, you know, equal states. But federalism will be very hard to uh, bring into practice. Uh, it requires constitutional change. It requires a different political pact between the minorities and the majority. And fundamentally, uh, it requires resolving issues uh, at the subnational level. How will the Shan in Kachin state feel if federalism gives the power to the Kachin? There's a lot of complexity that hasn't been thought about. Right. Jonas Again, is, uh, this comes. Jonas oh, sorry. This, asking to come in on yes, that. Yes, I know. Yeah, this comes back to the issue of constitutional reform. I was going to ask you, Jonas, um, that whether you think, given how critical these questions, including electoral reform and the constitutional issue, and which relates to things like this, you know, deep-seated problem of ethnic representation as well, do outside actors have any uh, leverage or leg legitimacy on uh, these questions? If um, for example, you argue that uh, the West should stay very engaged, but uh, perhaps uh, they should extract more leverage uh, over to target specific priorities. Um, well, I, I think that's a good question. And I, I would actually like to ask Richard from the inside to comment on that. You know, what is the role and potential of, 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 let me say broadly, the international community, if that actor exists? I mean, that's a very diverse description. You know, uh, uh, China, uh, neighbors in the region, uh, ranging out to the UN, uh, Europe, uh, and other actors. I remember, you know, in, in the first phase, um, when the military, before the elections, when the military opened up for reform, my experience was that they were very selective in inviting in external skills for their own reform program. For example, in the telecommunication business. Uh, we experienced that the telecommunication uh, regulations uh, from my country was invited in to share how can you adopt, how can you develop uh, uh, um, uh, 3G, 4G systems, uh, have revenues back to the state, how do you do it? So, for, so, so from a completely locked down country with no, no in external influence, they opened up. So what is the status now in 2020, just before these elections? What is the readiness to, 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 to have these ex this external input? Because my experience is that this is this this is a country that 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 could be very open, but it still has decades of being experienced with closed doors. So I, I think that the, the culture among these men and the sole woman who who 
is that the ruling position is that you know we can close the door again we can be we can be quite you know closing down or has the opening of the economy still open doors that can be used to be there to put pressure also on the political side i would imagine that coming from the outside with ideas of electoral reform to reflect a federal system with minority protection could on on the merits be very interesting i mean they could be they, they could be good examples that could be put on the table but is there a, a culture and a, and and a, an openness for that or is it rather you know this is external uh, interference let's close the door we are proud we have done this before we we we, we hold the grip i i think that is a very important um, uh, factor to understand before uh, you know the West the international community, whoever decides how to engage. So you know Richard sitting on the inside would be interesting to hear, and also from from AA how she sees it. Uh, Richard, yeah, that's uh, that's a really good, uh, really good question. I mean, I, I agree with what you said uh, earlier, Jonas, about you know we should not be turning back the clock, ten years, twenty years, to the way that Myanmar was was interacted with in the past. It didn't work. The failures of that period are manifest. Myanmar and the world's interests were neither of them uh, solved by isolating Myanmar and making it poorer and denying it, um, you know, exposure to, 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 to the world. But neither should we think that engagement and trade will automatically solve all of Myanmar's problems. Um, the world today is also very different, of course. Uh, Myanmar can be much more reliant on the region than it ever could in the 1990s or the 2010s. It has, a, it has geopolitical friends. Uh, it has a region that is generally supportive, and that allows it uh, to turn away from the West if it chooses. But it doesn't want to. It doesn't want to be stuck in the embrace of China, uh, a place which it struggled for years to get out of. It wants a counterbalance. The problem is that there isn't really a political psychology in Napidor of horse trading, of negotiation, of concessions that can enable the country, uh, you know, to, 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 to negotiate a path out of this. Um, and, and that's really the problem. There's a, there's a mentality which seems a little bit stuck in, you know, sticking to its guns, uh, refusing to concede and, uh, you know, continuing down the path that it had defined for itself. And that makes it very difficult for the outside world. But I think what the outside world shouldn't assume is either that isolation and sanctions will solve anything, they will only make it worse, uh, or uh, that engagement will automatically mean that the West is capitulating on its principles uh, on the changes that it wants to see. What we need here is, a, is an accurate theory of change, a realistic theory of change. Sanctions is not a theory of change. It may be virtue signaling, it may be a principled stance, it's not a theory of change. Um, Myanmar doesn't respond to pressure. That's just the way things are. You know, the sanctions of the past prove that. Uh, it's going to be a long, tough process of drawing Myanmar out into the world, changing that political psychology in Napidor. Uh, it's not going to be a process of, of horse trading or concessions or carrot and stick diplomacy, and definitely not uh, change through sanctions. Right. Thank you. E, um, your thoughts on that and what the international community uh, could and should do. I think we need more um, so engagement with the uh, political uh, international community because I think oh, sanction is not the right choice. Um, uh, so to improve Myanmar to move forward to the democratic country because we now so under pressure regarding to the Rohingya issue. So I think so this issue could be. Um, um, uh, could be has some of the barriers to improve, um, to improve, um, uh, how can I say, to improve that, to, um, so I think that is not the, the best way um, because we are, I think government, um, so they are busy with handling that kind of issue uh, rather than moving forward uh, uh, forward for other other issues that need to be addressed in Yemen. Right. Thank you. Um, uh, Jonas, I don't know if you have some more thoughts on, on how to respond in the ways you were talking about after the election, but we've got a question here from uh, Stefano Fantaroni uh, at the European External Action Service 
um, saying that while it's very clear, as Richard said, that these elections will not be perfect, um, they could be quite democratic uh, given the standards in the region, despite the shortcomings. Um, but already some NGOs, uh, probably a growing number are calling for non-recognition of the results and the new government, if I suppose the outcome is too egregious or too many people are disenfranchised. Um, what would, uh, for example, Crisis Group recommend for how the international community reacts to the results of, of the election? I know well, you that know, you said I... personally you believe in engagement. I presume for Norway, are you saying for the entire international community? Well, I mean, the international community is not one body. And I think uh, Richard uh, clearly described that. There is an option for Myanmar to turn away from, from democracies uh, and, and, and engage with the region. But I think Richard is absolutely right. It is not in Myanmar's interest for, for two reasons. One is that, you know, they would, they would seek a broader network. There is culture and tradition in this country also for leaning uh, in that direction. And secondly, it will not solve Myanmar's problems. It will increase its dependence on neighbors, and these are neighbors who don't care about constitutions and elections and, and, and these values. So, I mean, that's not oh. a, a lane to go down. I, um, I would... Hello, I, I think I, we've got... Uh... Am I on? Yeah, so, you know, I, I, I would argue that still a policy of engagement, but it has to be principled, I think, you know, um, the European Union and its external action service and countries like Norway should not shy away from pointing out deficiencies, violations, uh, and be very firm on that. Uh, uh, but again, I think, you know, going down the road of not re recognizing the election result, closing the doors, is simply uh, not going to help the purposes we are trying to, to achieve. I think we have to acknowledge that this is a country, again, as I said from the introduction, and I, and I I, I would say that I say this from a distance, and I feel you know you who live in the middle of it have you know a, a different experience. But from a distance, we have to see the historic perspective. We may be you know opening up a new chapter where Myanmar is not closed, where it is not locked down, where it is not uh, uh, hovering around in its own uh, contradictions. Uh, so um, what I would you know kind of favor would be a structured dialogue with an organized kind of agenda of points where the international community can uh, uh, play a, a constructive role. Uh, there should be some carrots and sticks involved, but, but this is not, as Richard said, hard bargaining. You know, this is not about if you don't do this, we will cut off that. Right. I think it is much more subtle than that, but it is one of the big tasks. And I think, you know, a lot is at stake in the region to see Myanmar gradually succeed coming out of, of, of where it is right now. Right, I see. Thank you very much. Um, we have uh, actually, this is a, uh, I think, a, a reasonable point. Alex Hamid Sievers of uh, the Heinrich Bell Foundation, Yangon, uh, says, we've already heard election cancellations are likely to reduce ethnic representative share of parliament, parliamentary seats, but wouldn't this automatically strengthen also the relative share of military representatives in parliament? Uh, beyond the 25% they have anyway, um, even if we are, you're only talking 22 seats, I guess it does, you know, the the maths. Or are these going to be filled by by-elections in the in subsequent year months? So, uh, so yes, it does mean that the military will have a slightly higher percentage. I don't know, 26, a little bit less than 26%. Uh, any seats that are cancelled, any seats that are empty. Uh, can be filled in a future by-election. The earliest a by-election can be is early 2022, because there is a law that no by-elections can be held within the first year. Um, so early 2022, yes, if the situation has improved. It's hard to see the situation on the ground in Rakhine getting dramatically better in a year, especially <laughs> after what's just happened. Uh, but of course, a different standard could be applied. So we could see these being filled through by-elections in the future. Um, right. It's possible. Right, okay. so meanwhile, the military will um, get a slight, even extra edge, um, but they hardly need it, I think. Um, just a, a question here from Thompson Chow, chief reporter of Myanmar Times, uh, which I think is a very timely question. We haven't really discussed the, the impact of COVID-19 
on the economy. It's disrupted key industries in Myanmar and put millions of jobs and livelihoods at risk. Why hasn't this economic damage translated into an economy-focused campaign season and compelled political parties to shift from security and constitution towards issues like inequality and welfare state. And I must say, he's right that in a lot of the coverage I've read, very few people are, are talking about um, the economy, but I've seen some dire surveys that uh, the majority of households in Yangon don't have enough food to eat. One would think that that's a condition for a near revolution, but not in Myanmar, I guess. Um, E, do you have thoughts on that? Why isn't economy playing bigger in the election? Um, um, can I skip to this question because I'm not good at so talking about the economic issue. Well, certainly, um, I guess you might have been looking at the election cover uh, campaigns so though, Richard. I know you are. Yes, I mean, uh, in one sense, the economy uh, and, the, and the COVID crisis is definitely impinging on the election campaign. There's been a couple of election rallies going past my window in the last uh, two days, handing out food uh, to voters who come out of our houses uh, to take them off a, off a party truck. Um, so there's definitely that kind of uh, economy at play. But you're right. I mean, if you look at the GDP figures and the projections that the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank and others have, have made, Myanmar is not in the worst situation in the region because it has a lower reliance on, on uh, trade and, and tourism than some other countries. But I don't think that accurately reflects the lived reality of Myanmar people because Myanmar, okay. the Myanmar government has spent far less money uh, on uh, stimulus uh, and on, on you know, protecting right. the livelihoods of the poorest. Uh, the channels for doing that are antiquated. They're not very sophisticated. It, it, you know, the government isn't able to push out large amounts of money to, directly to people. And so for the average poor family, there is no safety net. There is no government safety net. The social safety nets of the monasteries and religious institutions and society are breaking down because everyone is in the same boat. Uh, and, uh, and the poorest are, are, are particularly hard hit by lockdowns and stay at home orders. So for what I see, uh, even on the streets outside my apartment in downtown Yangon, is real signs of, uh, of problems. Why hasn't that become an electoral issue? Simply exactly. because there is no opposition party presenting a different vision or challenging the government. The national opposition, the military established uh, USDP is in disarray. Uh, it's, it's waving flags, but it's not pushing the government. There is no national dialogue on this and no challenges from the political opposition. It's very interesting. I mean, even in, in Thailand, which is absolutely engulfed now in, as, you, as we all know, in um, student protests, the economy is not, is not an issue really dominating the podium. But underneath that, I mean, there are staggering figures like uh, more than two thirds of the 520,000 new graduates graduating this month and next month do not have a clear idea of their job. That kind of thing is obviously fueling unrest. So I think that question was really aimed at, um, you know, clearly if the situation goes on with Myanmar and there's a meltdown of job market and uh, people with not enough to eat, I think it, it does seem a bit inevitable that there'd be some more uh, backlash, but uh, extraordinary that it's not playing out in the election campaign. Yeah, and I think just because it hasn't come out as a, an electoral issue ahead of the vote does not mean it is not a very live political issue. This is going to transform politics and society in the coming years in this country, as it will in many other countries. Right. Thank you. Uh, Jonas, you have your hand no, up. I, I, I'd just like to add my voice to that. And this is a general issue in all countries, from Myanmar to my country, Norway. We are focusing on the spread of COVID. We are counting the numbers of infected and, and, and casualties, but there is far less focus on what will be the long-term economic and social consequences, which is harder science, much more difficult. But you know, now that countries experience a second wave of contamination, I'm, I'm also deeply concerned about the second wave of the economic and social lockdown. And it's of course hurting poor countries much, much harder. And I think it's interesting for the Myanmar case that a military party, and the military setup, they don't have the instincts really in their institutional setup to be concerned about this. And this is one of the, the major weaknesses of this constitution that you have such a key element of the parliamentary setup. I mean, what is a parliament good for? It is there to, 
to, to, to pull in impressions from all part of the fabric of society and try to translate that into political solutions that will improve daily life for people. But with this setup of the military, they, they, they can block that. I think that is a real challenge and should be, you know, part of what the international community should communicate to Myanmar, that right. believing that having that blocking uh, position in parliament is, is, uh, is, is something that is uh, uh, providing stability over time. It may be the contrary. Right. Thank you. Um, we've got time for one more question, or uh, if I'm told that we can extend by a minute, uh, maybe two. Um, this comes from Marcus Brand, the uh, international idea head of mission in Myanmar. He says, there is scope for electoral reform within the scope of the constitution. It won't happen because of pressure from the outside, however. How could a coalition of stakeholders in Myanmar be built after the election to address such reform? For example, um, issues like the Union Election Commission independence, decision-making processes, malapportionment of constituencies, et cetera. Um, do you think a, a coalition of stakeholders like that is possible? Um, e, do you have any thoughts on that? I think it could not be possible, yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> That's bleak. Uh, yeah, it is impossible because, yeah, so uh, in the, in the uh, within five years, so and indeed they're trying to change the constitution and but so be, because um uh, because of the military uh participation in the parliament so it cannot be changed the constitution and it cannot be changed the constitution and also i think we cannot change the constitution it cannot be um so it cannot be an independent election and so we have to uh, we have to face uh, that kind of issue every five years, um, right. so that yeah, be, because of so many oh, things right. happening there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, um, Richard. Do you think uh, the, there's potential for building a a coalition yeah. of stakeholders? I mean, some doing? aspects, some of the most problematic aspects of the electoral system are baked into the constitution. So, first past the post isn't explicitly mentioned, but the constitutional tribunal has ruled that changing that would require constitutional change. Um, malapportionment is mostly baked into the constitution. Uh, things like the Electoral Commission, um, the president has the power to appoint the Electoral Commission for a term the same as the president. That almost guarantees a non-independent uh, Electoral Commission. But the president doesn't have to, uh, uh, you know, uh, skew this in the, in the most uh, um, uh, uh, non-independent way. It is within the gift of the president to choose who those people are. The current election commission is 15, 75 year old men. 13 of them are the Ma Buddhist. That is not a representation which gives credibility, independence or diversity and it does not reflect the country. That is completely within the gift uh, of, the, of, of the president. And I think next February, when it is time to appoint a new election commission, that is the time to be giving ideas, support, advice, uh, organizations like IDEA and others who are involved in this field, you know, choose a more diverse representative body. Uh, it's also good for the NLD not to be blamed for all the mistakes that an electoral commission may end up making. Right, but it's the government that is the elected government that has the final say on the makeup of that commission, right? Same it is the president, the yes, but the president well, can choose wisely. And they, they can form a stakeholder coalition, they know who to lobby. Um, just a, a couple more, one from David Camus at Sciences Po in Paris. Um, he says, as Richard indicated, given the archaic first past the post electoral system, strong parties are required to compete. What are the main factors? This is a very good question, I think. What are the main factors prohibiting the ethnic minor, all these ethnic minority parties from forming an umbrella party? I mean, I think we've been there before and um, uh, many discussions on um, how they've split their own votes. Could it be different this time? Um, E, do you have any thoughts on the the potential for all these little ethnic groups? Why don't they band together and form an umbrella party? Um, I think we we already um, explained about that. Uh, I think it could be impossible if we cannot change the electoral system. Yeah. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
And Richard, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, one problem is even if they did form this grand coalition, they would have 11% uh, of the seats under the current system. So it, it wouldn't bring them much more than just having separate representation. Right. The, uh, the ethnic areas are 25% of the electorate. It's not big enough to form, uh, you know, a decisive power block. Yeah. But the other thing is, why should we expect the parties and the communities from hugely diverse ethnic groups to yeah. all agree on a single Stand set together. of objectives? You know, that is, that is pushing Myanmar further down the path of identity politics, and that's what it needs to escape from. It needs policy sure. politics. It needs national parties that can represent everyone. There isn't a party of the left and a party of the right in Myanmar. There's a party of Aung San Suu Kyi, and there's a party of the old military regime, and that's what you have. You know, policy politics needs to emerge, and obviously right. that will take a long time. It's a, it's a young democracy. Sure. Uh, these things will, will, will take I time. think that, that question, though, could be particularly relevant to the biggest, you know, the Sham state, where that you've got a very, very um, powerful and big uh, a variety of uh, ethnic groups that, who nearly did, and actually at one point did, uh, have an alliance that kind of uh, fell apart. Um, there is a question also on that particular Sham state example from Frank Follner, UNDP, uh, senior parliamentary advisor in Indonesia, who, who does ask um, that uh, regarding Shan state, for example, the Shan state parliament situation, do you foresee see Shan nationalities league for democracy losing its small majority over the NLD or maybe getting even stronger? I mean, I think Shan politics are possibly in a slightly different category. Am I right? Yeah. Um, was that to me, Gwen? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, you... I think, yeah. I think uh, Shan state is always hard to predict. It's, uh, it's, it has huge diversity. You know, some of these seats have been partially cancelled. We don't know what the effect of partial cancellations will mean in terms of which parties win. But in general, I think there will be less Shan people voting for the NLD and more Shan people voting for the uh, SNLD, the Shan party. But it's a first past the post system. Uh, it's clustered constituencies. It may not dramatically change the seat count. Right, I see. Thank you. Um, and maybe a final one uh, on the Rohingya issue uh, from Hunter Marston, a PhD researcher from uh, Australian National University um, and sometimes author of op-eds. Uh, the Union Election Commission has disqualified a number of Rohingya and other candidates on grounds of inability to prove citizenship. Are there any Rohingya still running in the election? Uh, and additionally, but I think we've answered this, what potential is there for ethnic representation in the next parliament to reduce ethnic and or religious tensions? Um, perhaps, I don't know. Uh, are you aware of any Rohingya candidates running or are they all out? I think uh, some of the Rohingya candidates, uh, they are running. Yeah, they are oh, running. Right. Yes. Rohingya yes. Yeah, they are running. Yes, yes. There's a couple outside of Rakhine State, but all of the no, Rohingya like, candidates in Rakhine State were blocked uh, on right. spur spurious grounds. Uh, they, you know, they had the papers needed to prove what needed to be proved. It was a discriminatory uh, move to uh, to 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 uh, uh, to, to uh, bar them from the election. The same thing happened in 2015. So no okay. Rohingya competing for seats in in Rakhine State, but a couple, just a couple outside. Right, but not presumably representing a Rohingya party. Yes, representing a Rohingya party. There are oh, right. uh, three three Rohingya parties still with candidates in the race. Right, who presumably have been able to prove that they are eligible. Yes, uh, they don't have Rohingya in the name of the party. It's not an accepted uh, uh, word that can be used in a registered party name. Uh, but there are a number of Rohingya right. citizens, uh, yeah. including people whose you know parents were were quite uh, prominent in earlier eras right. in Myanmar. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think that's been a really great uh, sweep of questions and fantastic insights. I just wonder, would uh, Jonas, do you have anything you would like to well, uh, leave us with? Um, because just you've just, been... just one, one word from, from, from the greatest distance right now. I would say that you, you said, uh, Gwen, that, uh, that uh, this, is a, this is a young democracy. But I would say it's a young democracy with very old people in the leadership. Uh -huh. And, 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 and the demography is going to change that in a few years. So I think one area where the international community should engage is with young people. And, you know, th th this may seem a bit uh, uh, like a summer camp and it, it, it's hard work. But I believe, you know, keeping that transparency, the openness, 
addressing universities, uh, uh, having open doors is still a contribution to, to what I would say uh, would be future change. So uh, uh, in countries like this, including in the United States, I would say old people are replaced with old people. But still, you know, gradually there will be young people coming on. And I think that's that's an area where we should, as an international community, put, put um, a lot of attention. Yeah, that's a I, think that, uh, I think that advice and insight would resonate in Thailand, too, where I am, uh, indeed. Yeah. Um, and uh, lastly, uh, do either of you have um, some specific point you'd like to leave us with? I could. Uh, eh, you OK? Well, I'd just like to um, thank everybody for viewing and some great questions and really sorry we couldn't um, get to them. Um, but uh, hopefully there will be a few more um, um, events uh, before the election and a lot to talk about afterwards. Maybe we should uh, persuade this panel to do it again at some point. Uh, anyway, thank you very much all. And I think you can uh, review the uh, Facebook video, uh, I, I think. Um, anyway, thank you again and uh, goodbye. Good luck. Thanks, everyone.